Hi, welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Ineash Brodsky. I'm Katrina Stanton. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about animals. And very topically, we got a message from a listener, Edgar, saying, It amuses me that you all had a discussion of whether or not various animals want to live based on imaginings of what the insides of their minds might be like. Our empathy software is well honed on humans, but it's just not geared for elephants, for example. And so we find it really difficult to imagine our way inside the minds as anything other than anthropomorphism, of course. It seems to me that this tends to make discussions on the podcast and elsewhere go in circles. Some seem to tacitly assume that other animals have minds just like humans. Others appear to have made the assumption that they secretly have no minds at all. We tend to pose ourselves questions asking, well, do tadpoles feel more like people or more like mindless husks? Or if I were a dog, what would I think about as I fell asleep? It doesn't matter what answers you give, you're still making it all up. I know that assigning ethical significance to animals or just being in the world is difficult without employing gut reactions and other nebulous feelings, but don't let your willingness to employ your feelings be an excuse for sloppy thinking or allow yourself a back door into just making stuff up. Cheers. Well, thank you, Edgar, for that nice message. It's just so great that your message is here to launch our episode. I have a, a bit of a response. Mine might be shorter. I'm not sure. Before we start with the responses, I want to give a caveat that I don't think in this one hour of us talking, anyone's going to change anyone's minds. I, at least, I don't expect my mind to be changed, and I don't expect to change your guys' mind at all. I think this is more just of a conversation, maybe something to think on in the future. Because if anything, <laughs> if anyone came to a major revision of their opinion after one hour, I would be kind of surprised. It might be the jumping off point. Yes, right. I would say a jumping off point or like a seed or something. Yeah, or we're going to present such amazing, amazing thoughts and ideas and evidence that you've never considered before, and Ash, and you're going to say, oh my I, God, need, to you're right about I everything. need to change my entire life. That, that is, sort of happened to me in under an hour when I was a teenager. Yeah, in what, in what sense? In, this, in, in the uh, animal ethics encompassing sense. What happened? Okay. I read Peter Singer's essay, All Animals Are Equal, huh? and mm. it was like, I don't know, 10 pages. But I wanted to get to Edgar's thing really quick. So I think, because this, I'm assuming, especially the mention about dogs falling asleep was a reference to, at some point we talked of something about wireheading animals and that sort of thing. So there are a few things to keep in mind. I think, A, you're right in broad strokes about we're making stuff up about what goes on inside an animal's mind. I mean, we, we can consider some of the things that must, not must, are more than likely, more likely than not going on inside their heads uh, in many cases. You know, if if uh, you mentioned elephants, if if you see one moping around the corpse of a of its child, you can kind of guess unless you're running some something like sadness software in there. Otherwise, why is it doing that? Um, it could be something completely completely different, but then you'd be kind of tacitly you'd be you'd be tacitly implying that despite our common evolutionary heritage on Earth, we've come to just completely different brain states that don't relate to each other whatsoever and yet produce idiosyncratic behavior. Right. And that, that strikes me as unlikely. I was going somewhere else with that, but it's lost. What were you going to so say? So you are of the opinion that animals are fairly important and can uh, deserve moral consideration equal to that of a very young, dumb human? I, I don't think that we need to go to, no, okay. to measuring quite yet. Okay. I would also separate those two questions just really quick. In the same in the same breath, you said you think they're moral worth consideration up to and including dumb young humans. The, you can say that they that they count for something, and not say that they count anything like what people count for. Okay. Some some people people who I mean I don't know when we want to get into this, but nobody could get behind like current farming practices for like livestock, right? And admit that animals have any moral worth whatsoever. Like, unless, like, it's so low that the enjoyment you get from, like, your dinner, when it could be something else, not like you have to starve to death. It would have uh, to be literally down to the point of insects. Right. Or, like, basically nothing. I am really interested in getting to the question of moral worth in animals. If it's all right, if we can address Edgar's yes. comment first, talking about how we get inside the mind of animals. 
coincidentally, I was at a board meeting today just before this podcast and somebody else at the board meeting sitting right next to me had this book. It's Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? by Franz DeWall, who is a well-known animal behavior scientist. A little side note here, I actually, Tim and I um, saw him speak at George Mason. He had a really great speech and he talked about all sorts of amazing examples of animals working cooperation in abnormal situations and the mirror test and things that we might get into a little bit later. And then he ended it with saying, animals can feel empathy and therefore humans should act this way in the world and be kind to each other and da 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 learn from animals. I think everybody in the room kind of did a double take at that moment and said, you know, that doesn't follow from what you just told us. Similarly, I think it's going to be difficult to get a kind of moral imperative potentially out of what we, we talk about today, as you were suggesting, Anyash. Okay. But, so I unfortunately haven't, obviously, well, I could be a speed reader, but I'm not. I <laughs> haven't had a chance to read this book, but I promise I will before this podcast goes up, so I'll be able to correct myself and give examples. But I opened it up. Um, I think the word that you're looking for, Edgar, the, the idea of imagining ourselves inside an animal's head. How does an animal, how does a non-human see the world? Duval introduced the term umwelt, U-M-W-E-L-T, and that means the surrounding world. The umwelt of a tick in this example. What, what's the surrounding world like for a tick? Well, you hang out on a tree focused on picking up the, the sense from mammalian flesh, from mammalian skin, and then in the, you know, when that actually happens, drop down onto it, drink a blood meal, lay eggs, and then die, right? Mm -hmm. That world is going to be different than the umwelt of a companion animal, like Vivek or Dio, who we have in the room with us, who are, who are two dogs. We have them in the room specifically so she can blackmail us. <laughs> so she can point at the dog and say things like, You would kill these doggies? You think they have no emotions? That's known as guilt rather than blackmailing. <laughs> Some of us don't <laughs> distinguish the two. Emotional blackmail. <laughs> so what animals want or like is a really tough question. There are so many different ways of being, and we shouldn't assume that humans and non-humans share motivations or desires, right? Right. Broadly speaking? Broadly, or like we shouldn't assume... Specifics. I think mm, any brained animal probably desires like food. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So like, uh -huh. I think that, that it wouldn't be a leap yeah, to say that like so... some, like for whatever it is, like for a dog to want something, it has something corollary to what we want when like we're hungry. Well, when in the, when in the evolutionary, when in evolutionary history did the sensation of hunger show up? Probably right? really early really on. Really early. Yeah. When did the sensation of fear show up? Also very, very early. What about... Empathy, that probably showed up along with um, maternal care, or that's one of the theories. The other important question to ask ourselves is, are animals worthy of more moral consideration the more like humans they are? Are social animals more worthy of moral consideration than solitary animals, because we are social animals? Are great apes more so than canids, because they have larger brains? So... Is relatability the most important factor? And what are other important factors? Is that a question you want us to answer? Or are you just raising? And Edgar's basic point was that you can't really know what's inside an animal, and therefore you can't uh, make guesses about what, uh, what it's like to be an animal, right? Yes, and I mean, interests and wants. Edgar said that you can't tell what the interests and wants are, mm -hmm. but... Those are ways to talk about utility. Right. And you can measure utility functions in non-human animals, and people absolutely do. Uh, yes, I, I want to say that I agree with Edgar most of the way, that I don't... There, you can make some assumptions about what animals are driven to get, but I think it's fair to say that it's, it's a big leap to say that animals necessarily have a sense of self or emotions in the same sense that humans do. We can get into sense of self. Um, when I said the mirror, mm -hmm. the mirror in the jar and, you know, different ways that people measure intelligence, mm -hmm. 
you nodded. Like, you totally know what the mirror test is. Yeah, you put a mark on the animal where you, they can't see it, but if they see themselves in a mirror, you test, well, you observe whether they react as if it's a different animal in the mirror and try to wipe it off them, or whether they try to wipe the mark off themselves. Or, you know, just ignore it. and um, or, or if they yeah. turn and turn their bodies to look at it better. Or um, if they're aware that the mirror is a reflection of them. Yes. So that's one of the tests of, one of the most simple tests of self-awareness. Dogs don't pass that, but other animals like great apes, pigs. elephants, pigs? Pigs, yeah. They, well, they we, don't all, have we the... did already know that pigs are more intelligent than dogs, right, babies? Oh. And uh, these dogs. What, what? <laughs> <laughs> Some corvids. Oh, yeah. Ravens. Corvids are really smart. Also, colloquially known as feathered apes. Hmm can definitely pass that test and do other um, other problem-solving tests better than than great apes can do. For, for some of these, the questions, what's self-awareness? Mm -hmm. How can we measure different degrees of self-awareness? What kinds of experiments can we do to measure intelligence? And then the truth is there's other kinds of intelligence, right? If an animal is color changing, for example, a lot of, of the large brain of an octopus, um, the theory behind why the brain is so large is because it controls the texture and patterning and coloration of its skin. Was this a thought experiment I read about or an actual experiment? It must have been a thought experiment where it sounds possible in practice to play like a Charlie Chaplin film on the on an octopus. If oh. you could if you could wire to its brain and uh, do the right interface. Oh. Because of because of its because yes. of its ability to change its colors so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are it's like a display, right? So the way it works is they have chromatophores on their skin which are pigmented cells, they each are, have a pair of muscles. And when those muscles contract, they pull the chromatophore open so it's visible. So you have that color. And then when it relaxes, it closes. And so they have tons and tons of these all over their surface of the skin and are able to control all of them on, on, on different layers, right? Because they have different layers, different pigments on different layers. But yes, I think in theory, you could probably play that, and it wouldn't even have to be Charlie Chaplin. It could be a color film. I think there is, theoretically, jumping topics here, sorry, <laughs> uh, but, but a little bit back to where we were. I think there is, uh, theoretically, a way to judge how um, intellectually developed and how self-aware a thing is, and it was proposed quite a long time ago, and that is to ask it. In, in AI circles, this is commonly known as the Turing test, where you try to talk to the machine and find out if it can uh, talk back. And if it can, that's a good indication that maybe there's something in there doing some sort of uh, mental analog to thinking. I think it's not entirely fair to ask animals things because they cannot communicate it quite in the same way we can, but you can have some communication with animals and they do not pass the tests very well at all. I wanted to say really quick, I wanted to respond to what you were saying, but I have a facetious counterpoint okay. to, to the ask it proposed test, right? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Siri, are you sentient? I'm sorry, master. I'm afraid I can't answer that. My phone calls me master. <laughs> awesome. Dio, are you, are you sentient? Oh, Nothing. he licked him. Poor Dio. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, get, I get where the test is going, but I don't know if that's the, the appropriate litmus test and if it's even like the appropriate question to ask, right? Maybe it's partly like how do you interact with it? Like if we could speak dog, but like because I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't can't speak dog because dogs don't have any sort of communication or language abilities. Right, but... dogs do have language abilities, right? Um, they have a number of different ways of communicating. Uh -huh. They have ways of communicating, including, including vocally. But like I couldn't ask somebody who speaks Japanese, "Hey, are you a lot? Are, are you are you on in there?" Well, you could. If I spoke Japanese. Well, even if you didn't, I mean, that's the first contact problem, right? There's some way you can figure out to communicate with things. And we've been doing it with animals for a long time. And we've been getting much better at doing it with animals. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say that this biases social animals that have high communication abilities. Okay. Um, again, and over solitary animals that don't necessarily have that as well developed. I think it, this uh, is a personal opinion, but I think solitary animals are intrinsically less beings because a lot a lot of the mental complexity that makes something a person comes from having to develop the mental models of other people. And once you can model other people, you start to be able to model yourself. And solitary animals do not have the need to model other people. They never develop that sort of uh, mental 
mental infrastructure needed to become more sentient. And I feel the need to just clarify that I don't, I'm not shitting all over the Turing test. And I, my, my, my example with Siri versus the dog was deliberately facetious. That is not an accurate, re- accurate representation of my actual beliefs. Also, Dio's clearly sleepy. Oh, that's true. If he were, if he had had his morning coffee, he'd be. If he knew that his life was in the balance based on <laughs> the, the decision we make after this hour, he would be paying a lot more attention. Another solitary animal is an octopus. They have mental abilities like memory, and similar to a house cat. I definitely don't think that being in a community versus being solitary is is a huge difference. But it might be an important. Speaking of in a community, are you guys aware of prairie dog language? Yes. Okay, just in case the listeners aren't, because it's super interesting, there's a researcher who worked with Gunnison Prairie Dogs, Khan Slobodkiov, and I'm so sorry that I butchered that. I'm going to share his website also, so you can take a look at it, and there's videos. But basically, what this researcher did was drag a bunch of um, stuffed dead animals and also walk with humans and walk dogs across a prairie dog colony, recorded the vocalizations, and was able to kind of dissect those vocalizations later um, on the computer to figure out what each part meant and what was being communicated. And the cool thing was that the prairie dogs were communicating with nouns and modifiers, the noun being the type of predator, and that could be human, human with a gun, dog, hawk, coyote, the size, so a large human or a small human, the color, different different things that people would be, they would wear different jackets or put different coats on the dogs as they walked across, even shapes. I've also been very interested in animal communication because, like I say, it's a fascinating subject. One of the things that I have had pointed out to me is that when you study animal communication, Animals do not have the ability to have any sort of... I mean, they have communication, but they don't really have language. They have different calls they can make, but they cannot... They don't have a grammar. They can't... I I know, I'm about to go. They uh, can't conjugate sentences. They cannot talk about something that isn't immediately present. They can't talk about things in the future. They can't convey emotional states that they aren't currently feeling. Well, I think it's probably a little bit difficult to test. For a prairie dog talking about something in the future, you can't have something happen and then go back and and test what that is. Well, no, I love uh, animal communication studies because these sorts of things do come up and I find them fascinating. But in in all these cases, it seems that the the communication is very much a comment on their uh, immediate surroundings and language and survival type things and has very little to do with higher level sorts of mental processing. It's also interesting to note that they can coin new words and, um, you know, being like able... Like human with gun. Yes, being able to distinguish between a human and a human with a gun. Obviously pretty important. Yeah. And, I mean, think about, you may also be familiar with the crow and the presidential mask. That is awesome. Which is a study in which the, the researchers wore, I want to say Nixon masks? while they were banding birds, realized that the birds recognized them by the Nixon masks just as they were walking around the city and were communicating to crows that had not been banded that those Nixon mask people were jerks. And the other crows were responding, um, and they continued passing that message. I don't think anyone's arguing that crows aren't secretly sentient and plotting against us. I actually, yeah, I kind of, crows are in my top level tier of suspecting they might be almost uh, close to human level. Like, give them, a, give them another few millennia. So Because I, they are just amazing, some of the shit they do. They're, they're, they're creative. Yeah. Uh, just as far as directional, or as far as coordinating the conversation, mm-hmm. does anyone's position on the moral status of animals hinge on how smart they are? Mine does. That, that's why it's actually a thing that I'm a kind of, uh, that I think is very important to, to me personally. Gotcha. Because due to, due to my... Well, do you want to do that? Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, due to my transhumanist roots, and I, okay, not even roots, due to my transhumanist philosophy, I, I've long had to consider what, what I would consider uh, sentient. Like, my decision theory, I have to take into account, would this decision theory still work if I was running against copies of myself? And so one of the things, one of the first things you think about is, well, how do I treat beings who are not carbon-based and look like humans, you know? What if I become uploaded into a computer? Uh, I do not want my rights taken away. So when I was contemplating moral theories, one of my 
founding bedrock principles is that intellectual uh, complexity does matter, and it's probably the only thing that matters. Ah, mm. uh, you're so black and white. In 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 briefness, just so I can help coordinate like where I want to go with this. Because what is what is the moral what is the moral importance of a Terry Shivo, for example, someone who's in a coma and doesn't have a brain anymore? I mean, she's human shaped, and she technically has a human brain. And technic, well, I mean, little bits of it, most of it was gone. But she has no moral status. You can kill her, and actually probably be a good thing to kill her, because then she's not draining resources and giving her parents false hope. And uh, She is nowhere near the level of even a fish. And not in she's moral certainly not up to the level of a dog. Not, like, not, a dog is more important than Terry Shiver. I'm not referring to moral consideration, because while I think that intellectual complexity and ability is an important thing. Mm-hmm. I don't, I certainly don't think it's the only important thing. What else would you consider important? Really quick, I just want to throw my head in with what Katrina said. Mm-hmm. And that's why, that's why I wanted to clarify. So raising examples of how smart some animals are sometimes, to me, is sort of beside the point. Because my, my position on the ethical status of animals doesn't hinge on how smart they are. If it did, uh, it, that, that has all kinds of sort of weird... Uh, consequences if you if you take it and run with it, mm-hmm. but that, so that's it. It's like it's, to me, it's interesting. Like uh, when Anyash asks you, um, what how how stupid would a baby have to be before it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that's 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 one of the things that you can kind of get into. But I, like that, I said, I wanted that that brings me it's up to the question of how do you feel about abortion? Um, <laughs> that is one of the things I considered. Like why. I should I be okay with abortion and why or why not? Right. And I do not consider a fetus a person because it is not yet in, uh, mentally complex. I have a, I have a I have an answer to that that I think both of you will hate. So give me just one second. Okay. Um, I wanted to say that for me the intellectual capacity of animals is uh, interesting and important to look at just as far as what can they do and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But and it might it might have some weight as far as how much moral weight they have. It might have some more uh, what am I trying to say heaviness. Okay. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it it might be a a larger part of the of the equation then, but I I, I don't think it's it certainly shouldn't be the only thing that matters. Cer- it, not not certainly the only thing that matters. I mean, so what I, else matters? I well before we get into that, my my thing on abortion, I am of the position that abortions are a bummer. Well, whenever yeah. whenever they happen, right? I'm not I'm not pro abortion. I, so that's right. I knew I knew that that would get a scoff out of out of somebody. <laughs> oh, um, so, very few people are pro abortion. I'm not going out there many people encouraging it, people to get pregnant so that they can abort the fetuses. Right. I, as, and I guess I think some people aren't necessarily pro abortion, but they're they're way they to me it's a bummer because you have an actual instantiated uh, possibility an individual that you know the whatever preconception was so close to not existing that it didn't even matter like they they ought to have ne- they the odds of them existing were like nothing right mm-hmm. the the random shuffle of genes so then you you've got that instantiation ready to go um and, yeah, in, but and in you progress get that every month when uh when there's a menstrual cycle you get that fucking every time a guy comes there's Whoa. there's what no, I there mean, could have been well i a mean life created from that well by that thinking, I mean you you commit a potential holocaust every time you scratch your nose because I mean your cells and your nose could be cloned into a whole new you, right? Exactly. But I mean that you have like the actual fertilized, uh, it's fertilized no human you. ready to go. It's a right. recombinant. Well, to the people who would say like, oh, it's not human, or it's oh, it's not alive. Like it's definitely both of those things. That yeah. two human parents. It's uh, I've, re- I've re- never I've never um, contested that. I've no. always simply said it is not mentally complex enough to be a person. Yes, that said, I am uh, I'm very pro choice uh, to the to the extent that. The, the weight of the fertilized egg, embryo, whatever stage you want to have it at, is so low as to be outweighed by the preferences of a parent, right? Or a potential parent. Uh, certainly the host, right? So that's that's where I'm at. Is I, I'm not like gung-ho pro-abortion, as some people I think are. And I'm not... Uh, it also I'm, leads to the interesting question, if the potential is what really matters once we can make humans on computer chips potentially you know trillions of combinations of different humans are instantly possible and is it a bummer not to make them all come into existence is it like the most intense moral tragedy to or moral imperative not to make as many copies as you possibly can and maximize the number of of persons right no i hear you i don't think that that's the case like i said so for me it's, it's more just like you know the it's sort of an aside but that's my my thought on abortion what was the other question what matters other than intelligence mm-hmm. yeah um 
I mean, certainly, I think at base, a capacity for having preferences, desires, sensations, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Yeah, those are uh, all matters of mental complexity, though. Right, but I mean, they there's there's a like a sharp line between even slug and rock, mm -hmm. right? One is doing something that slugs do, and rocks just they exist, but not like in the same way, right? Well, I think slugs, slugs are, I want think... to they hunger. Maybe. You know, I think they want slugs to eat are things? a decent example because we're getting close to the point where machines can be as complex as slugs. Are you do are, do those machines? Will those machines have the moral weight of slugs after that? Probably. Okay. Yeah, I, I I'm certainly ready to throw my my uh, what's the phrase? Hat in the I don't know. I already used hat in the ring. Right. I'm certainly ready to get behind the idea that computers are capable in. Possibility in theory. So my, my, my thermostat, my thermostat wants things. It wants the temperature to be a certain. Your range. thermostat does not have desires for the temperature to be a certain. Range. We cannot look into my thermostat's brain any more than we can look into a dog's brain. But my my temp my thermostat certainly is goals that it shoots for, and it has a way to affect the environment to reach those goals. I'm not arguing my thermostat is anything more complex than an insect, but in a, a something that controls an entire house might be complex enough to be equal to a worm or a slug, would you then be as hesitant to turn off your house at night, or if you're leaving on vacation, as you would be to step on a, on a worm? I think that that's an interesting question, and at some point, you could, I mean, you can push it down past worm and get all the way down to something, and there would be at some point where I have to say, you're right, maybe. But the, the thing, I think the thing with the thermostat example is that it's, it doesn't have a coordinated system. I think its, it's idea of preferences and desires is fundamentally different from uh, you know even a lower animal right because you can uh, relate to it well because it I don't think that it gets a sense of satisfaction out of uh, out of attaining 72 degrees in the in the house does a worm get a sense of satisfaction out of eating a certain bit of manure it probably gets something that makes it want to keep doing it well, so does the thermostat it it doesn't need to want anything it just it, it does what it's told right yeah well so and the worm's just following its evolutionary programming all right, so I mean, I, maybe I feel it gets like you guys are feedback. getting stuck in a little bit of a loop over there. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly what Edgar said. People said so, just yeah. start talking can in circles. I, um, but can I can I break you all out a little bit and tell you what else I value in animals? Yes, we never got to yours. How about abilities they have that we don't have? Ah, because they're, so they're instrumentally valuable to humans, or just for themselves. Okay. How about I value what animals can create and do for themselves? I value the way that a killer whale mother can teach her child a certain hunting technique or a certain language. Or um, a monkey can teach her child to wash a piece of fruit before eating it. Okay. I, I can definitely see the value in having biodiversity. That's culture right there. So I'm interested in that. Um, I, I think that's amazing. So uh, what they can do for us, how about what they can do for the world and other animals? How about the incredibly complex interreactions that start on a molecular level? I, I in, do in not non, care about molecules. In non-human animals, they have amazing you know, different kinds of interactions that are happening, starting molecular level, going through cells and tissues, okay. going through intraspecies interactions, so inter interactions among the species among themselves, and then interspecies interactions, symbioses, mm -hmm. predator prey interactions, ecology. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all fascinating and amazing and wonderful and worthwhile in its own right. And, you know, if you want to put the selfish uh, hum humano-centered because we have evolved to think that humans are the most important and specifically that we're the most important. Mm -hmm. This is okay. There's a lot that we can learn and get from that and we are constantly learning and getting more from that. Can I ask you about can the even, beauty of natural systems? You can even study... I was shocked learning about aphids. Aphids are very well studied. Um, learning about how aphids are so simple. They don't have much of an immune system. They have um, kind of outsourced their immune system to other organisms that live in them. Okay. You know, like I'm, that's that's so cool. That is actually very cool. I, but uh, my question would then be, 
if you place moral weight on these systems because of their beauty, which I think is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. I, I value a lot of things just because they're beautiful. Do you ever look at the horrific sides of nature as well and weigh that off? I don't think I said beauty at any point. That was... That, that is certainly the... That was well, you didn't word. say that word, but that was the impression I was getting, that the complexity and the way it all interlocks and it's interesting and it's... There's I, I got a sense of it's, beauty. It's worthwhile. Just... Just but you only itself. mentioned good things. You didn't mention the horrors of animals eating each other while they're alive and intestinal parasites eating, you know, things from the inside out. Well, those are all we, they those also have intrinsic value. The truth is there's well, a then lot it's, of different Isn't it a negative value at that point? No. I mean, I've I've, it's, I've heard it's negative it's negative for the animal that's being parasitized. It's negative yeah. for the post, but not for the parasite and not well, potentially obviously, but... parasites have a lot to, to but, teach I mean, us can... about dealing with the immune systems of their hosts, which leads to cancer treatments. Really okay, quick. so again, they're useful utilitarianism but I mean, a murderer probably gets some sort of utility out of murdering yes. someone, but we still think that he's a bad person. Yes, but his... <laughs> or hers, or theirs. Their, their preference also matters. It's just that everybody else has a pre strong preference that they not be murdering people. Okay. So the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yes, they okay. can. Well, so, so, but, so the truth your... is there's all these different values. And sure, you, yeah. any Ash, or, or me, or Steven, we can all weigh them different amounts ourselves in our own lives. But but each one of those has consideration. It has weight. What, what Vivek wants has weight because Vivek wants it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I'm... I'm going to disagree with you on that in the future, but I want to get back to something else first. In the future, meaning in a few minutes. Okay. Um, the I personally do not uh, hold to this, but I have heard people saying that one of the most moral things that humans should make their absolute quest is to destroy nature as soon as possible, because nature is a carnival of horrors, and the mass negative utility does not outweigh what occasional goodness and beauty we see. And so one of the best things that we should strive for is to eliminate all natural suffering by eliminating all the things that suffer. It's, uh, there's a really interesting, very short story by Alicorn about the subject where, um, where dogs, where the last dogs were made sterile and they lived out their own happy lives and then there were no more dogs. And after that, there were other, other things that took the place of dogs, but that were not dogs because, because well, various reasons to get into the story. But the, the point being that if you are making moral judgments of nature, it's probably safe to say that nature comes down on the negative side of that equation. I, I don't know why you would glean that from what I just said about everything having moral weight, I, including things that you would find horrific. Uh, you do not give negative weight to bad things? Like, you, you don't think that torture is negative utility? Yeah, well, I mean, if using Vivek... This, this small Chihuahua Terrier guy, mm -hmm. as an example, if he has an intestinal parasite, if he has a, um, a flatworm, right? Mm -hmm. um, if he has tapeworm, and that's like not a good situation for him, that is negative utility for Vivek, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And because I care about his comfort and well being, mm -hmm. and that's valuable to me then I'm going to give him medicine to kill that tapeworm. Okay. And that's negative utility for the tapeworm. Right. Right? Because we're... And I don't want to, like, get crazy inside the tapeworm's head or anything, but animals generally want to survive. Mm -hmm. Right? That is a fair assessment. Also, I think that the desires, the desires, the utility of animals changes at different levels. Okay. And they can be and what, contradictory. What is it that... So you uh, would you say that the Vivek, uh, the dog here, is more important than the tapeworm because he's simply more emotionally relevant to you or because he's actually more valuable than a tapeworm for other intrinsic reasons, such as mental complexity, for example? <clears throat> or, but is, it, is, it, is, it, is there some difference between him and a tapeworm or even like a colony of tapeworms? Or is it only because you have emotions for him and not for the tapeworms? So, a couple different things, right? Mm -hmm. um, before I said that intellectual complexity is not the only thing that I value animals mm -hmm. or humans by, but it is one of them. Okay. So, in my dance, right, I've got to balance um, that Vivek, while 
not being the smartest puppy in the whole world is much, much smarter and more interesting, can do more cool things. Well, tapeworms are actually really neat. Oh, God. But, uh, <laughs> more, more things. Vivek, you're not going to survive this hour either. Vivek, I'm sorry, boy. I'm so sorry. I have in my pocket a vial full of tapeworms. Do we want to give them to, <laughs> to Vivek to watch them grow? or do No, we want... but I almost infected myself on purpose once. Not with tapeworms, with... Okay. but with Giardia. Uh, which, um, which is Giardia? Oh, it's uh, it is a prozoan that you get from drinking um, non-purified, non-sanitized water. Was this for uh, an allergies thing, or is this entirely different? No, I just wanted to. Oh, you just wanted to. You're <sighs> you're a strange person. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to pull my hat out of Katrina's <laughs> ring. Here. Well, no, I wanted to for science. Anyway, you can get away with a lot as long as you say those two words. You can have my hat back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, so it wasn't it wasn't for the moral utility of being a host to this invasive species. No, it was, although it was I used to not swat mosquitoes for that reason, okay. um, because I was like, oh, it's just a little bit of blood and some itching, mm -hmm. and this mosquito can now you know like have a whole brood of babies and I oh god, have a good life. Jesus. So I I, you, I I I disagree that mosquitoes can have a good life. There is no sense where anything a mosquito can do is good because insects, in my opinion, are are right on the edge of, of robots. Wait, so so let me go back a little bit to talking about different levels. Kind of like moving rocks. Yes, right. yes. I would very much consider insects just <laughs> stimulus response machines. I can sort of get behind that. Because I, I would say that the negative, negative utility I get from uh, scratching at a, uh, a mosquito bite that could potentially become infected, that I could potentially contract at West Nile during the receiving of, uh, is probably... The, the negative utility from that probably outweighs the positive utility of the lifespan of a mosquito. Dude, fuck all that. The negative utility of having a little bit of itching as you as a human is worth more than a mosquito. Because mosquitoes are worth literally nothing. Dust specks? Yes, they're on the same level <laughs> wow. as dust specks. Considering what mosquitoes are capable of, mm -hmm. if there was a little robot that did that, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be a dust speck worth robot. <laughs> I, I brought up dust specks specifically as the... Uh, the torture versus dust specks. Yeah, thing. the torture versus dust specks. Uh, uh, Thought experiment. Understood. Uh -huh. So, so what I was what I was saying was that there is there is what the utility of an animal on an individual level. Then there's the utility of an animal on a family level, right, or a community level. And then mm -hmm. there's is skipping probably a couple levels. Then there's the utility of a species. Eye level, metaphysical level. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, j really quick, you mentioned the community and the. Uh, the social aspect of, of one of the levels of, of uh, moral weights to an animal. Yes. And so for that, so solitary that, animals, it might be an individual plus their offspring, right? Mm -hmm. But that was, that was something that I was going to weigh when Enosh mentioned the solitary animals. As far as, and I hadn't considered the argument that much of our empathetic software comes from being able to model ourselves and using that as a model for other people. And that's how we interact with them and, you know, anticipate how our actions will affect them. I think mm -hmm. it actually, and, uh, from what I've heard, the hypothesis is it started the other way around. You modeled other people because they, those are the things that you interact with and you need to model. And eventually that got turned onto the self. The Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So I think that that's, that's what I meant to say. Okay. Um, and that social animals lack that, which means that they, that they very well lack much of the self-reflective software I, that I we have. I don't think they lack but, the ability to model other animals but and what they're going to do. Let me, let me... Not to the same uh, level as social animals but, often have to. Oh. Uh, maybe I was... Yeah, that's... that's so, that, solitary animals. I was just rehearsing okay. my interpretation of Vinyash's argument really quickly. But the other thing to consider with the lack of social interaction for a particular animal or animal species, I think would have a net... Or would, would have... It would decrease the amount of weight you put into them as moral beings because the amount of people... The amount of other things that would be bummed out by them dying is less, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, you, you consider not uh, necessarily. Predators are often keystone species. They're often solitary, don't, don't, and predators often have bigger brains than other animals. I think we're moving the goalposts though, because we're not. We're talking about like the. I mean, maybe not. Uh, I, I don't know if a predator would mourn the loss of. I don't know if the hawk would mourn the loss of a of, an, of a field mouse. Because uh, it's sad that it died, I think it would be like, oh, there goes my dinner, right? So it's not, it's not, those are two different kinds of caring about things, I think. I thought you were talking about solitary animals that people, people or other animals or just other, other entities would not be bummed if they died. And I was just saying, 
lots of solitary animals, like, uh, let's say leopards, right? Big brains. Um, they need that to be clever hunters. They have to model the behavior of their prey animals, which are, you know, wonderfully co-evolved to be able to evade them. And they have to, you know, they have to be good hunters or they, they won't make it in the world and they won't have offspring. Now, if an animal like that dies, you think that it probably has less moral weight than, say, a social gazelle? Well, I think, isn't that I think what you all... were just saying when you said you got to consider the social utility of an animal as well? So I, I just to answer your question very quickly, I do think that all other things being equal, the amount of suffering caused by your death by, say, things that care about you in some manner uh, adds more weight to, to, okay. that, to that thing. that's fair. So that's, that's another layer to add. And then what I was saying was, from an ecological perspective, the loss of a keystone predator can have major repercussions in the rest of the ecosystem, right? So that can potentially, in that way, be a lot more damaging than the loss of a social animal. But it seems we are, again, talking about the utility of, of species to systems rather than actual things like moral weight. Yeah, are we talk I think that we need to, to solidify what we're talking about as far as are we talking about individuals, individual organisms in and of themselves, or them in their relation to a larger ecosystem? I think you have to talk about all of them, and I think that all of those have moral weight. If I, as a biologist, say I give moral weight to biodiversity... Mm -hmm. I am right out the gate saying things that immediately conflict with giving moral weight to individual animals. Okay, I well, yes, but um, as, as an example, I can see there being a case made where the lives of maybe all the leopards on Earth versus the life of one human, where the lives of all the leopards on Earth may be more important because of whatever devastating effects it may have on ecosystems and how that will waterfall and affect a lot of other humans, you may want to choose for that human to die instead. However, in general, any large group of any individual animal I would never place as more important than any even one human. Yeah, I really disagree with that. Okay. I'm torn. I, I feel... I, I, I hear what you're saying, and at some point I would say that if you get a sufficiently high number of leopards, uh, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to put it, a number to it, yeah. uh, but even, even assuming the environment would be fine. Like, say if we could clone a billion of them and put them like just in a ball on the moon and like all right is it a bad thing if we blow up this ball like uh if I, we're doing that i think the moral imperative is to find the guy who's making these billions of clones and stop him right because that's the problem there was that saturday morning breakfast cereal where it was like you know intro to philosophy and everything is about like you know what if hitler was doing this and that and it's like i think we need to find the guy who's cloning all these hitlers <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so so in, in in any in any situation that I think is remotely applicable to something that might happen in real life, uh, humans and animals are not really even remotely comparable. I I can totally see where you're coming from, but I I just mm. I have I, I mean I, I'm not saying I agree with him. Okay. I'm I mean saying, there I'm are some can... there are some differences. Like I guess the dodo bird really didn't matter when it went extinct, but if if you would have to cause a species to go extinct to keep someone alive, then it may not be worth it. But in, it just in in as a general rule of thumb. It is. Tim and I talked about this a little bit in the past. Okay. How many sharks would I die for? Um, That's a good question. How many sharks, what kind of sharks, what size of sharks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because the loss. So if, hmm. so sharks, for example, are apex predators or can be, and they provide a very, very important ecosystem services by depressing numbers of other predators that are a little bit smaller than them, right? Um, and that allows little little animals and reefs to exist, and it's just... Um, it's, you don't, you it's, there's don't a big trophic clear... cascade is what that's known as. So Wouldn't nature eventually, over a few millennia, adjust and refine a balance as a new apex predator emerges? Like mm, super crocodiles? I, I'm pretty... <laughs> I think it's it would probably... Probably not because the reefs won't exist anymore because we're also doing all this. We've had asteroids slam into the earth before and yes. nature recovered. Okay, so eventually, eventually, yes. Uh -huh. Right? Okay. Eventually, after after humans are extinct or do something good, then... Um... Well, let's not bring into humans. Let's not bring humans into it yet. Let's focus <laughs> just on the animals. Humans will be fine, in theory. Okay. 
The truth is the repercussion is potentially lots of human beings starving. Okay, well, I mean, in that case, I agree with you completely that there's some level of sharks I would die for. If you want to if you want to bring it home, right? Yeah, but ultimately my, my measure of value is how many humans does it hurt? So if, if, if there was no impact to humans at all and it was just animals in the ocean, I wouldn't die for any number of sharks. I'm wondering if I've been framing this question wrong this whole time and I need to consider the world impact on a larger scale when I'm considering the, the moral weight of animals. Or if it's easier to like work with specific examples and say, all right, look, I'm going to breed rats. They wouldn't exist otherwise. They're not going to exist with the environment. They're going to live in my lab, okay. and I'm going to do science at them, and it's going to be terrible to them. They're going to suffer. I'm going to vivisect them while they're full of tumors and whatever. That's reasonable. I mean, See, that's a reasonable uh, thought experiment right. that actually happens. Well, that's my point. <laughs> so it's, it's a thought experiment of, of, of real life, right? So... If we're only going to consider the effects on the world at large, um, say, if, say if I'm just doing pointless science, like I just want to see how much uh, whatever it takes to kill them, right? And I'm never going to tell anybody. So my... my, my well, in that case, you're not doing science, you're doing torture. Well, all right, fine. I'll tell some people in a hundred years, whatever. The point, is, um, the, 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 the point is, is that as long as I'm writing it down, it's science. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't have to tell so, people for it to be science. You just have to tell people. You have to write it for down. it to be good science. Okay. So my thinking is that that is still a bad thing, uh, be, not 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 because of its weight on the ecosystem at large or its potential fallout through nature, but because they these these rats have some moral weight to them mm -hmm. they they have perfect desires they they feel bad and by feel bad edgar i mean that they you can measure distress levels and distress levels go up when you torture a mouse in front of its friends uh the the friends get freaked out um you can also measure cortisol levels in mammals for right. example which are produced when we're stressed and yeah so there, there's all kinds of, of ways to depending on how your moral scruples are you can literally just you know, plug into their brains and, you know, stuff too. Not, let me, let me, let me clarify. You can't matrix them, but, uh, yeah, you can, you can get, you, you can, can get give them real pleasure shocks and, and you can give them, you can get real time feedback on how freaked out they are, you know, without even having to go in and, and take blood samples and measure cortisol and stuff. Can you? Um, I think so. Oh, that's cool. I, yeah, that was, mm, I'm led to believe that. Okay. Uh, but my point is, is that I think that that is a useful level, at least to have the beginning of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, once once you get up to, like, the ecosystem falling apart at the death of all the leopards on Earth, then, like, it becomes, like, well, of course they matter then at that point. But my point, my, to me, a more central question is, if I have a leopard that no one knows about, that I'm just throwing horrible science at, is, am I doing something wrong? I, I think, I think so. I think that it's, that the I fun I get out of, of doing science at it, I'm going to quit saying that. Uh, the, the fun out of get out of, out of vivisecting it. Say if I'm just vivisecting it for my own pleasure. Which yeah. uh, okay. dissections are objectively fun. I okay. You, but you have different measures of fun. But than me. also not worth it. So you're talking about uh, things like relatability. That leopard can feel fear, right? It can feel pain. It can feel. Deal. I wouldn't even say necessarily relatability. Just the fact that it has. I mean, I guess I could only do so in in reference to me, right? I guess so. I'm thinking what, of it in some yeah. some regard. But what but... if the leopard couldn't feel pain and couldn't feel fear? Oh, then do whatever you want. Yeah, if it if it but, was just a Terry Shivo, then go nuts. But yeah. it's not a Terry Shivo. It's a walking animal that we don't that we're not smart enough to know how smart it is to quote this this book title. Okay, well we're. <laughs> When you give us a hypothetical that the leopard does not feel fear or pain or anything, those we're are, assuming those things, that well, those are things that you know to be true and are telling us. If I you, am. If, I'm telling you those. I'm telling you those things. Okay. Well, if it's but a let's, but you know, let's say it um, evolved separately from our evolutionary uh, lineage, and it's not really a mammal. Mm -hmm. It's just it looks a lot like a leopard and does a lot of very similar to leopard things. Okay, the leopard but from moon. From the, moon. from the moon. It's leopard from the moon, but not the one that was cloned and put in a ball. Mm -hmm. It's a different one. <laughs> okay. And I'm just saying this because there's a picture of a leopard on this book. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> who, who is looking very, uh, very calm and, and slightly interested over its shoulder. Well, in the absence of knowledge, I would say it's probably best to err on the side of caution. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, right? Because... Because that's the kind of... This of... is an alien leopard, right. and we might not know what other abilities it's developed, right? or, or what, it, what it means to be, what pain means to it. And sort of like with my, my thoughts on, you know, 
uh, I mentioned this. I had a friend call who listened to the voting episode, and I mentioned that I want to generalize my voting out al- my my decision to vote algorithm to like other people. Yes, mm-hmm. I would want to, and that's how you win the. That's how you uh, choose cooperate on the prisoner's dilemma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For that same reason, yes, when in doubt, err on the side of caution because you would certainly hope that they would take that that they would err on the side of caution with you, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is a good time to bring up the one note that I remember to to jot down that awesome. I wanted to bring up. Neil deGrasse Tyson bugs me whenever he mentions animals. Or no, whenever he mentions... So he, he has this this chain of reasoning that goes, uh, you know, we share 96% of our active DNA or some some number up there mm-hmm. with, with chimpanzees, and yet we're building rockets, we're writing sonnets, we're doing all this cool stuff, and that's only 4%. So imagine what, like, another 4% could do. And he's like, so what if what if there are aliens that are that smart and they come to visit Earth and they're like, oh, look at look at Stephen Hawking over here. He can do theoretical physics in his head, just like little Timmy over here. And that they might they might assign you know as much or less moral weight to us as we do you know to things that are that much dumber than us, right? And so, and that you know what if what if we're just like ants to them, and you know they they conclude that we don't matter, just like we conclude ants don't matter. That chain of reasoning always bugged me because if you're flying from solar system to solar system. You're coming across rock after rock full of nothing but rocks. And even you know, so then you, you come across one planet swarming with satellites mm-hmm. and, you know, full of people with like, you know, that have harnessed electricity, harnessed the atom, you know, make music, whatever. You're not going to be like, oh, they, they're just like the ants that also live on that rock with them. I mean, I, I certainly can't imagine, I guess maybe Edgar would draw a problem with this, but you can draw similarities you can draw tentative speculation on what it must be like to be an organism in the universe, because I, I would argue that uh, any complex life that arise, arose in the universe uh, came about through something like Darwinian evolution, right? And so some of the similar motivations were likely drawn into that. But my mm-hmm. point is is that it was just a thing with Neil deGrasse Tyson arguing about, uh, or saying something along the lines of how people, or how you know the aliens might find I'm running in a circle here. Yeah. My point is, is I, that I found an annoying, annoying analogy because there's no way that they would think that, Neil. Come on. Right. Also, so. the whole, you know, whatever percentage difference DNA is not responsible for a greater intelligence. Yeah. Of course, there's a whole bunch of differences between us and chimpanzees, and there's even more differences between us and ravens, and ravens are pretty darn smart. So that's Arguably not a... smarter than chimpanzees. Uh, the, I agree with you, more, uh, more or less, in about... Ways. In ways about uh, that's why I said arguably <laughs> uh, about uh, being annoyed by that that comment from Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, if we're tra- if we're attempting to communicate with things using prime number sequences and such, there's obviously some sort of intelligence. Uh, however, that being said, I, I have uh, read fiction before about uh, alien species that are an entire order different order of intelligent than humans, just a higher level, uh, something more than night, basically angels. And it presented a really interesting dilemma to me because I, because, uh, I, I, in reading that book, I came to realize that I do actually think that angels have more moral weight than humans because they are that much smarter or, you know, in the book angels. Mm -hmm. So if we were to run across an alien species that is significantly more intellectually complex than we are, I would think that any individual member of that species probably has more weight than any single individual member of ours. But how many? That's a good question. All, uh, of, us, I, I think, all of us for one? Right. You know, it won't make I, much of a difference to them if we're gone. Exactly. I think that's one of the reasons it would be important <laughs> to make sure that we are either useful or uh, oh my or no such situation ever occurs. Or, like, not at least in their way, right? So, I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's the kind of thing, uh, you know... Or delicious. Or delicious. <laughs> <laughs> And then we found out that penguins tasted great with sriracha, and we eradicated the species. Um, so <laughs> there was a, a joke by Hannibal Burris along mm. those lines um, that I think if it turned out that they were delicious. <laughs> what was I going to say? Yeah. So the the other thing with the with the Tyson comment is that, at least from from my perspective, I don't know where he I don't know where he goes with this, or if he's even talking ethics, or if he's just talking for fun uh, on that topic. But to me, at least to the point that. Uh, your measure of intelligence isn't the only thing that matters. Um, it might it might weigh in considerably, but there was a, a great quote. I should just dig it up so I don't butcher it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and post the essay online and then I can just butcher the quote now. In Peter Singer's All Animals Are Equal, which was a 1975 or 76 essay published in the New York Times? Time Magazine? Something like that. Um, basically kicked off the animal rights movement. That's what I thought you had done. I read his book. 
Oh, yeah. So, the, oh, wait. The book was called, oh, the book's called Animal Liberation. The essay mm-hmm. was called All, All Animals Are Equal, which is the 10-page version of that 300-page book. The book has 290 pages backing up the central thesis that's shelled out in the first 10 pages. It was something along the lines of, and I think he was quoting, oh, I can almost remember the name, a, uh, this was some, some quote from the mid-1800s. It was, a, God, if I'm wrong, I'm going to sound like an asshole. It was, I think he was quoting a slave rights activist uh, who was saying, look, even, and I think this woman was a slave or a former slave or at least black. And she had said, look, even if we take what you say and that, you know, my, my, my cup is smaller than yours, am I not at least entitled to my little half measure? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you know, just cause I'm capable of less, does that mean I literally deserve nothing? And that sort of drew home the point for me in that, that poignant little essay in the context of, or that, that point, poignant little point in the context of a larger essay that, yeah, we can't just look at intelligence, right? Because right. otherwise, like, the smarter people matter infinitely more, way, way, way more than dumb people. And while they matter probably a bit more, um, you know... I guess it depends on what they're doing. Right. I mean, certainly if it's if it's a mad scientist, you Are know, they really nice? torturing <laughs> leopards on the moon, then yeah. Um, we certainly, they <laughs> some, might matter some less. Some negative than, utility there. Right. But, I mean, I guess as far as, like, their, what they're capable of, they're, I mean, to some, so to some degree... Somebody with an IQ of 40 is probably less valuable even to themselves and how much they want to live versus somebody with an IQ of 140, right? And, unless they're, you know, unless they're not depressed and enjoy their lives, like a... Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can capacity. necessarily say that. Someone with an IQ of 40 may want to live just as much or more as someone who's really smart. That's yeah, fine. Well, and how I, much do you think that Diego wants to live? My point is, is I, I just to get my just so I don't sound like a, a a dick about people you know who might have uh, IQs of 40. I wasn't. I'm not wedded to those numbers or to like that premise exactly. What I'm saying is that the the intelligence matters somewhat, but I can't see that it should be the only thing worth considering. And that okay. to, the, to the extent that you argue that it is, you would argue that people with less mattered le- matter that much less right mm-hmm. so that's 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 what I was arguing against um, uh, or, try, or trying to if I, if I wasn't talking myself in circles no 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 <laughs> well, I get your point and if I were to be logically consistent then I would agree with you <laughs> however for uh, various reasons I draw a line at the birth of a human and at that point anything above that I uh, I consider more or less of equal worth and this is because we are humans yes Okay. Because I need a nice shelling fence to uh, prevent things from going in terrible, terrible place, places. What's one fun thing about reading from different disciplines? I happen to read these books right around the same time. Oh, should we um, define shelling fence? Yeah, shelling fence is actually a really good thing that we should talk a lot about. You can define it really quick now, but Please I do. want to talk about it when we do an episode eventually on uh, self brain hacking or like whatever. That that's a to me that's a very useful tool. So yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. yeah, go ahead and define it. Okay, uh, so uh, shelling fence is a takeoff from a shelling point. Have we talked about shelling points earlier in the game theory episode? Yes. Okay, so shelling points something that everyone can converge on naturally mm-hmm. because there's something that uh, just makes itself apparent as a natural convergence. Shelling fence is the same kind of thing, but it uh, acts as a barrier. For example, in the natural world, the rivers are often uh, boundaries between countries. Mm-hmm. Because there, I mean, you can draw a boundary between country anywhere you want on a map, and then people argue, well, why don't you put it ten feet this way, or why don't you put it twenty feet that way? And there's no, there's no. Apparently, necessary... Norway and Finland are doing that right now. Are they? Yeah, moving, okay. moving the border forty Back and meters. Forth. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's, it's since it's an arbitrary line, there's, it's really hard to justify why have it one place and not another. But if you latch onto something physical and apparent in the real world, like a river, then you're like, well, because the river is right there. Uh, so we stay on that side, we'll stay on this side, and everything will be fine. Even though lots of times, you know, cities get built up on both sides of the river, and in some places, like uh, Kansas City, become more or less indistinguishable as they're just one big city, even though they're in two different states. Ah, but back on topic. Uh, so a showing fence is something, some place where you draw a line, because it is clear and uh, makes a natural demarcation. And so I do that with uh, birth of a human. Because that's when it comes out of its mother's body and it is its own being. And it is definitely a human and alive. So that's that's a better point than any other. Because at any other point you're like, well, why don't you move it one day forward or one day back? Well, well it's... it also, you know, is not, it's not a super defensible line. 
It's, well, um, it's, it's only depends evolution. on what you're trying to defend against. So if you say, oh, it's its own person, well, it's its own person, but it's also parasitic yes. on a host before. Yeah. So, like, oh, it, that's not an enormous difference. <laughs> it, it's not, but it is, but it, is it, simply, a... it is something that you can easily see in the real world. Yeah. And I identify very quickly. Richard Dawkins, in one of his books, raises the point that it's only an accident of history that our... Uh, ancestors that were of in, you know comparable intelligence to us have gone extinct. Extinct. Mm-hmm. Um, that if it if it weren't the case and we had Neanderthals still running around, uh, would would we include them in our moral circle? Mm-hmm. And it, well, they're not humans. Say, say if they were different enough that we couldn't breed with them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, they're not humans, so no. Again, it would, would depend. they be among the other great apes in almost going extinct and we use them in commercials and keep them in cages? And teach them to smoke so they can act in movies? A lot like. of it to me would depend on how how intelligent they are. Can they talk about the future and about people who are not present? Okay, so your test isn't just did it spring from a, a female womb, but or from a female human womb. It's uh Barring that, what else can they do? Animals the, have Well, I'm saying anything above that shelling fence of a human coming out of a womb is equal uh, is equal weight, regardless of what their relative intelligence is. Okay. Like rel- an IQ 80 person and an IQ 140 person, I consider, yeah, worth the same amount, even though going strictly on a what is the intellectual complexity, you wouldn't do that. But animals that have a similar intellectual complexity to a three-year-old human are completely beneath your consideration. Because uh, they haven't passed the coming out of a human mother's womb test. Exactly. Okay, that, cool. I, I, let's I'm... end on this note. <laughs> and you can judge who won this debate. I, no, let's not end just on that note. Because <laughs> I do this... Um, I do this for various political and, as I was saying, preventing horrible um, consequences of of not doing it reasons. But when it comes to when it comes to, for example, a being made out of silicon, I would be very interested in whether they are as smart as a cat or as smart as a human. And I think that and that that draws uh, at what I was saying about our our evolutionary intermediaries, right? Uh, so. I'm trying to uh, avoid the eugenics programs where you say that people less intelligent than you are worthless and therefore should be eliminated or just killed outright where they're standing. And I think that is extremely immoral, and that is why I put that shelling fence at humans, because they are, uh, if you don't consider them of equal worth, then you can start coming up with justifications of why some should be killed and others shouldn't, and that has terrible consequences that we should avoid. I want to make a quick caveat. Animals can talk about, you know, animals can consider things that are not there and other animals that are not there. Really quick, I wanted to say that it's fortunate that we live in a world where the test is so easy uh, for first Yeah. 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 And so, like, if we did live in a world where Neanderthals are running around, uh, we might have to, like, have tests for them to pass or something to determine whether or not we can eat them, right? Mm, So, I I mean, I would assume the Neanderthals would create their own communities and that we would, you know, work with alliances... Smarter chimps than whatever, right? So, <laughs> well, I mean, a large part of having rights is can you enforce those rights? And if the Neanderthals can enforce their own rights, then they have rights. But there are groups of humans that cannot, and that's why you have your fence. Yes. Okay. I think that that is a uh, not completely unreasonable position to take. Um, that I it makes the drawing the line at humans non arbitrary for a good reason. Okay. And and most and most arguments that talk about how uh, important it is for to to not draw the lines that humans don't really get into that at least that I've seen so that's 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 interesting okay and what animals talk about stuff that's not around animals take into consideration other animals that are not around all the time right whether you are making a scent marking to look for a mate or to uh, making a different kind of scent marking to warn other animals out of your territory. Mm-hmm. Whether you are a monogamous seahorse that hasn't seen their mate, but it doesn't take a mate for a few days. Yeah. I mean, seahorses, they, they work on a kind of shorter time scale. Right. But like that kind of consideration, that and then, or if you're a crow or, a, you know, that's communicating about yeah. something that the other crows haven't seen themselves. Um, 
or a prairie dog, and you're communicating to the other members of the colony about something that they cannot see themselves, mm-hmm. right? So there's there's definitely that kind of communication. I mean, it is amazing how simple animals can be and still learn. Um, you, you may have seen the archer fish face recognition. I have not seen that. Oh, it turns out archer fish can recognize human faces. Neat. And they recognize their feeders, and huh. they, um, I guess, did an experiment on it, but they first kind of figured it out because um, certain people would go into the lab and not get bothered, and other people who were feeding them regularly would go into the lab and get a face full of water. Ah. Isn't that the same way they, uh, what's, what sparked the, the president mask test that some um, student researchers noticed when they came back the next year? Various crows were dive bombing them and really aggressive to them, uh-huh. and they're like, "What the hell happened? Why are these crows attacking us?" And yeah, they 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 tested to see whether they could remember human faces, and yes, they could, That's and awesome. they were very pissed. Yeah, don't fuck with the crows, man. So it's interesting. I feel like Katrina and I are on the same side of the, of the on the same side of the fence, but in different camps. Uh, to me, it's it's less about animals have like their culture being inherently important. And this, so, so I mean, I see what you're coming, see where you're coming from, but I, I, I'm it's more just, important to them. Is it important to them in the same way at all that is important to us? Like, if I mean, would does they, a dog worry about what's going to happen to its children after it dies? I don't know. I think that we could look into tests about dogs and anxiety and worrying. They certainly do worry mm-hmm. about things. Do they worry about their children? Considering that empathy well, probably worry? developed from maternal care, then yes. I agree they worry about their children, but the question was, do they worry about the future of their children after that dog, after they themselves die? Do animals know about their own mortality? I mean, there's evidence that they do. Temple Grandin um, is very, Dr. Temple Grandin's very famous for her work on slaughterhouses and lowering the the panic and fear in animals as they walked in by making it so they couldn't see their herd mates being killed. But if I recall correctly, that was much more of a uh, frightened stimulus in the environment and less of a... Uh, I'm about to die. Well, no, no, no. Even though I'm about to die, yes, I'm about to die because I see a thing that's about to kill me, but less of a recognition of, you know, I am a mortal creature... And someday I will no longer exist. So maybe those are questions that we can't ask yet. Right. We didn't even get into food or dietary preferences in this episode. And I, I thought that that would come up in the first 15 minutes. So. Uh, well, I actually, I, I'm not as strict about it anymore. But due to the fact that pigs are pretty smart, for uh, quite a number of years, I would never eat any sort of uh, pig product. And nowadays I try really hard to avoid it, but I don't I don't beat myself up over it if I have some now and, now and then. I don't buy pig products either. Okay. Uh, Same reason? Yeah. Exactly. The uh, and I get that at, at some point you're kind of like, well, how many chickens equals a pig? And I'm right. like, ah, so I mean, I, but, I don't that, care that, about chickens. But but that that is a fair argument to make. Says the uh, person who actually has chickens. I, that should worry you. I, 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 <laughs> he, doesn't, he, doesn't love, he doesn't love them. I do not love these chickens. I have not named these chickens. I think these chickens are kind of dicks. Um, I've never met someone who reared chickens that actually liked them. It, it was it was an interesting I point. Have. Uh, okay, yeah. Scott, I guess, I guess I'm, think, I'm, think, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of farmers because since since chickens do provide so much less meat per individual life than cows and pigs, it's become kind of a thing in the in certain rationalist circles to not eat chickens. Right. If and you're gonna eat meat, eat the thing that provides the most poundage of meat per life lost. And uh, I I of course completely disagree with that i think eat the thing that provides the least amount of mental complexity per per pound of meat which right. in my case is actually chicken i focus you, on chicken a lot because i consider them dumb fuckers um, also, <laughs> dumb loud also, fuckers yeah. yes but really quickly okay. just because it's a joke uh but scott alexander said you know you aren't really a religious group until you have your own prohibited animal <laughs> like the jews and muslims got pigs the 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 hindus have beef and now the rationalist movement has chickens so we can call ourselves a religion, finally. I was going to say that, but you wouldn't um, choose to slaughter an elephant over a bunch of cows. No. Because there's other considerations. One, oh. an elephant's much more intelligent. Yes, that's the one. But that's, that's yours. <laughs> right. Also, they're endangered, 
right? Yeah, yeah. So they're in danger of, of being wiped out as, a, as their own species. So that's another consideration, right? Mm-hmm. Another moral consideration on that of why you wouldn't go and eat elephant flesh. Yeah. Hunters are always fond of bringing up like, well, we control the population. Otherwise, you know, that, that bad things would happen if we let them overpopulate. And I'm like, yeah, that is not why you're out hunting. You're not doing it out of moral imperative. No, uh, but it's a good excuse. If but, you're yeah, going to kill but, all the but, predators, but, then you're going to have to keep the pre, uh, prey species down yourself. If you're going to admit that it's an excuse. Right? Oh, yeah, D- yeah. Don't act like you're doing something great. Gotcha. Um, uh, that said, you might be, but you're kind of doing it by... It's like, it's like positive collateral damage, right? <laughs> yes. You're out there killing for fun, and it happens to have an okay in, I- I- impact on the environment. Yeah. Um, Katrina actually was the one who raised my, raised my consciousness to the... I, I hadn't considered... For me, it was all about, well, chickens are stupider than cows. I know that, so I'll eat, I'll eat chickens instead. So I didn't eat cows. I didn't eat pork. I ate chicken. And Katrina was like, yeah, but think of how many chickens think of how many chickens you could eat versus how many cows you could eat in a year. And I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> but it's just like, that's like at least like 100 to 5, right? I'm not really... I, I, didn't, I didn't do the math. Well, but you could eat 40. 5 cows in a year. That 1 to 40? A lot of cows. Scott Alexander had a post about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's a fair way to put it. That's a, I'm, I'm fonder of the taste of chicken. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't made the shift fully yet. Um, but yeah, as long as I'm going to be eating meat, I should do as little, uh, suffering as possible. Right. So, so when it comes to actual actions, the results matter, Yeah. right? The results specifically matter. If it comes to actual actions, what we all should be doing is not eating factory farm food because those places are horror chambers. Even if like, we should all be involved in trying to pass litigation yes. and that like regardless makes it more difficult for condensed feeding operations. Yeah, good luck Regardless if it's chicken this, or this country beef or worships whatever. farmers for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they like small farmers. So there are organizations like, um, I want to say it's Society for Responsible Agriculture. Maybe not. Maybe that's not what it's called. But they work with small farmers and communities, usually small kind of rural communities, to stop large factory farms from being built in their community where they're going to be impacted. And um, it honors our weird love of farmers. And <laughs> a local a local farmers. And since if we're actually the focusing of America. Yeah, <laughs> right. And if we're fo- focusing on uh, impact, a lot of people have managed to put pressure on the really large buyers of beef, such as McDonald's and mm-hmm. other other restaurant chains to uh, switch to now get more uh, f- less horribly sourced meat anyway. And since they buy so much meat, they have a large impact on how the producers actually produce meat. Yeah, Many I believe that of- Mark Beckoff was the one who worked with Chipotle. Okay. Um, who is a local to Colorado um, animal philosopher, let's say. I think he actually is a philosopher. Oh, cool. Um, McDonald's recently made the switch or made a commitment to make the switch to mm-hmm. uh, cage-free eggs. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure, or was it cage-free or was it, uh, there's another word for it. And it's an important distinction. Uh, as it turns, there was something about. Um, this... Yeah, there's all sorts of small distinctions like, do the chickens have access to any sight of the outdoor sky? Right. Yeah. Do And it turns out that that gives you a special label, even if it's a window in the warehouse where they're all still living in stacked cages, right? And yet so, it still makes a big difference. It does. Any any step forward is good. I, I guess, but I wouldn't pat myself on the back for that step, right? They're still so <laughs> miserable that they're trying to peck each other to death, so you have to cull their beaks when they're born, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you, whether or not they have a window, like, I guess that's, that's, that's great, but let's not, like, pat ourselves on the back for five years before we make the next step forward, right? Interesting story I heard. Uh, when we when we summon Azathoth, sometimes we do not do it very well, uh, Azathoth being a, a useful um, shorthand for the process of evolution, or metaphor for the process of evolution. Uh, chickens, when they were being selectively bred, farmers would simply take the ones that produced the most eggs and breed those over and over, because you think that's the way to get chickens that make the most eggs, right? Uh, a lot of chickens lived in communities, though, and what the what hap- ended up happening was the more aggressive chickens would peck the other chickens, and the stress of being attacked constantly made those other chickens less lay eggs, lay less eggs. Mm-hmm. So the most aggressive chickens were the ones that got bred and eventually got to the point where they had to start ripping their beaks out to keep them from pecking each other to death. So they don't rip their beaks out, but they do cut off. They cut them off with a hot knife. Right. Well, they don't literally rip them out. I guess. Um, that's an interesting story. Yeah. I didn't hear about that, but that makes a lot of sense. I'll have so, to double check my source and post it on the uh, website just to make sure that I'm not pulling this out of my ass. But it is a story I heard, at least. It is the exact opposite of what happened with those foxes in uh, yes. in Russia. 
Because which, they were beating them for being nice and peaceful. Right, then you basically get, like, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Does so, anyone have any important closing remarks that I hope... I mean, I think that, I think we've covered, we've covered a lot of our points. Certainly not all of them. There is an endless amount to say on exploring the inner life of animals, mm-hmm. on um, different people's approaches to... This is just kind of a little a little teaser, I guess, to how, how we feel about the topic. And I'm really happy that our two guests were here today, even though they didn't have speaking parts. Dio and Vivek are both... Oh, now we have to take the vote. Which one of them lives and which one dies? Uh, that was not part of the contract. <laughs> Damn it. All right, you but both guys both get to live. Obviously, Dio lives. He's the better dog. And Vivek. Vivek doesn't. Sorry, little guy. He's named after a god, right? Sleeping. From Morrowind. Oh, so he gets to live on forever anyway. Yeah, that's right, little guy. We love you. We love both of you. I didn't finish the tribunal expansion. Do you end up killing Vivek? Or just dealing with him? Anyone who knows Morrowind, feel free to write in. <laughs> <laughs> or I can look it up. All right, let's do our listener feedback. So, um, a historian actually wrote us about our Adam Bomb statements. Sasha wrote, um, regarding episode 13, you didn't mention another theory behind the dropping of the bombs on Japan. That is, when Truman came to power, he knew of the Manhattan Project only in the vaguest terms. Vice presidents were, in those days, mostly decorative. They were a spare, needed only if the president was incapacitated or died. Truman relied on his advisors for information, and these included Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, who had just overseen the Manhattan Project, which had spent two billion U.S. dollars, about twenty-six billion dollars in two thousand sixteen, according to Wikipedia, on a super-secret weapon in order to defeat Adolf Hitler. Germany had just been defeated by conventional means before the bomb was ready. Stimson would presumably have to justify the expenditure to Congress after the war. It has been suggested that he had every motive to encourage Truman to drop the bomb and justify the project's existence. Similarly, Leslie Groves delayed the Slizzard, <laughs> that is not how it's pronounced, Zillard, thanks. Zillard petition against the bomb, <laughs> so that it did not reach Truman until after the bomb was dropped. Very few historians today still look to monocausal explanations for events like this, and for good reason. Personally, I think ending the war quickly was the main factor behind Truman's decision, but it's a reminder that in real life most decisions are driven by multiple motives and often influenced by more than one person, for all that Truman claimed that the buck stops here. This, of course, complicates game theory enormously and makes it far more interesting. Keep up the great podcasts. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. That's pretty huge. Uh, I'm inclined to take your position, uh, given that you're the expert on this. So, I love the, our listeners. They really make the podcast a lot better with their input. And so right. Uh, <laughs> there are, of course, even when we go about our day-to-day lives, we generally have multiple motives for what we do, yeah. and not one main one. So you'd hope that people who are in positions of deciding to murder... Um, millions of people that they would also have uh, multiple inputs I would hope so (laughs) or one really really good reason (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have a listener input from a name that I can't pronounce but fortunately he says that you can call me Sebastian which is my backup name for English people I think we that was the person whose name we tried to spell out on our first listener feedback episode okay but what was like the Zavla whatever yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He had a question uh, regarding the Game Theory episode. He says he was listening to it, and he didn't quite get the part about the transparent box with 10,000 and the opaque box with a million. He tried to rewind and re-listen and still didn't get it. So, like, one needs to choose if they're going to open just the opaque box, which might be empty, or two boxes. And what? What's the deal after one opens the box or both? And uh, the answer is, that's that's pretty much it. That, yeah, then the game's over. Yeah, you if, get what's in the box or boxes that you opened. We might not have mentioned when we, when we re-recorded that part of the episode, that whole thing is called Newcomb's Problem. Yeah. And so if you want to look up more into it, uh, it's got a great Wikipedia page and I'm sure a hundred others. The main, yeah, the main point is, do you trust the additional information given by the fact that the person running the, running, what, the experiment is an excellent predictor of character yeah. and has been right many, many, many times before. 
and um, therefore go with a single box to avoid, you know, potentially not getting anything at all? Or do you just open the box that you can see that has the smaller amount of money in it? Or I guess, no, open two boxes and then risk only getting the amount that you can see. There yeah, we go. Right. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So, so basically, you either you both you either open both and get either ten thousand dollars and nothing, or ten thousand dollars and a million, or you open only the opaque box and get either nothing or a million, depending on what uh, Omega predicted you were going to do. Yeah, it's fun. Look into Newcomb's problem for a longer explanation and all the uh, arguments for both positions to take on it. Anyway, uh, I think I, that's it for, for feedback on this one. I actually did have one more piece of feedback which was given verbally. Mm. And this goes back to our polyamory episodes again. Shelly said that she actually had a pretty good steel man reason for uh, why polyamory might not be as good as monogamy. Being that in polyamory, sometimes you have to keep things from partners which can distance you from them. And I personally didn't understand that, so I wanted her to give an example, and she actually gave a great example. Good, because I'm in exactly your boat so far. I'm thinking, Am well, I in that example? No. Good. I'm thinking, if you have to keep stuff from your partners, are you doing polyamory right? Right. Let's find out. So her example was, let's say that you have grown up with your sister who you love very much, and you guys share everything with each other, and then you grow up and you get a partner, and then that partner, once your relationship has gotten really close, tells you something that you cannot tell to your sister for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. There is now a little bit more distance between you and your sister than there used to be, and you still love her very much, but it's not quite the same relationship it was before because of this partner that you have. And she said, if you can imagine that happening with a sibling, you can imagine that happening with two partners that you may have at the same time. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I thought that was a really good point and also a little bit sad. That seems like the cost of just having what Seinfeld would call a vault. You know, something that you're told that you never tell anybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Being good at, at keeping stuff that's absolutely confidential, confidential. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that. but I mean, I don't know if that's a problem unique to pull polyamory. No, it isn't. Uh, so like, she's, like she said, but I guess it, it, in, it would increase the number of people that you have to keep things from. It's not necessarily unique to polyamory, but I think there comes a sort of assumption in monogamous couples that anything you tell one person in the couple, both of them will know. There's even that assumption in the law where uh, spouses cannot be made to testify against each other. It's as privileged as the lawyer-client privilege, if not more so. It's uh, yeah. It's considered you know quite a big deal in society that generally if you tell one person or a couple something they'll both know. Hmm. At least that's what I've always assumed. I never tell I something to someone who's in a relationship that I don't want the other partner or partners in the relationship to know. I guess I just don't have that many secrets. But I'm sure that secret the whole if two people have secrets. I'm sure there's all kinds of rules. But I think that might be something I've heard where I definitely had friends tell me things that I cannot share with my husband, for example, yeah. or anyone. Right. So, That's to hard. friends, don't tell me something if you don't want, you know... I'm just... I'm bad at secrets in general. Don't tell me secrets. I don't like them. <laughs> I, if you I, kill someone, I will tell the cops. Unless they really had it coming. I think it depends on me for the secret. Like, you know, I, I know stuff that I haven't told my my partner because why would she think it's interesting? Mm. So, like, it's not... Like, I don't, I don't do a lot of gossip. So, like, if it's like, oh, my God, this person told me that they did this and she's like I don't know who that is why would I care it's like you're right why would I bother telling you so I kind of just imagine that on the drive home and I just get the whole part of the conversation but that's a, that, that's a fair point and I think her point is taken whether or not uh, it applies perfectly to me so yeah that's awesome thanks for listening you can contact us at the no Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast at gmail.com no the <laughs> but no, if you do go to the Bayesian Conspiracy, that's the website, and I will have read the book and, you and potentially have have more stuff on there and more information and lots of links. And you can post comments on our website. You can, you can, or also Reddit. Reddit is um, better in some ways because you can upvote things and talk with other people in you know. It's just an easier way to comment. Yeah. yeah. So uh, consider Reddit. The Bayesian Conspiracy subreddit. I think it's R the Bayesian Conspiracy. Yeah. So. All right. That's that's all the ways to get in touch with us. Um. Anyway, thanks for listening, and talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.